Mac, we are back. I rhymed, didn't mean to, but either way, Matt Tennant is with me as always. Another week, another episode. Matt Tennant, how you been? Where can I check out? What's going on? I've not been too bad, Travis. And you can check me out as always on Twitter at the Perfect Tenant. And you can purchase my book, The Undertaker: A Trip Down Death Valley, <laughs> next month. I hope. Hopefully, hopefully, and hopefully, my glorious intro will be in there as well. Yes. Oh, good stuff. Uh, as always, follow me on Twitter at the Big TFD. Hit that subscribe right down below. Check out all the other shows right here. Uh, brand new shows coming in the future, so look for that. Uh, thank you guys for all the feedback. Once again, man, the numbers don't lie. <laughs> Last week, man, yeah. we went to the Battle Royal at the Albert Hall. You guys really enjoyed it. You enjoyed our misery, but we appreciate it either way. Uh, thankfully, we got a better show to review this week. Uh, but as always, Matt, before we get into any of that, before we get to any UK news, any of that stuff, a little <laughs> different start to the show this week. It's been a week. It's been a week it, with our uh, our social medias and all that. <clears throat> Stand back, Matt. The hurricane came through this week. Yes, he, uh, he came through. And for anyone who, who hasn't you know, followed us or kept up with our, our Twitters this week, the hurricane sent out a message. A message? I should say tweet, shouldn't I, really? Um, he sort of lambasted fans and people who used to be in the industry for for hating on it, you know, in the in the present. And I responded, and I was actually the one that tagged you in this, Travis, because I know you came along later to say I've just been tagged in this, and now I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I responded to Gregory Helms, Shane Helms, whatever you want to call him, um, and I basically said I wasn't nasty. You know, I wasn't a violent fan. I basically said to him, um, along the lines of, you know, us consumers who pay for the product, who sit through it every week, we have a right to demand the best and to complain when we don't get it, which I think is fair enough. Yeah. And, you know, a, a, a few of us on Twitter, you know, chimed in and Helms came back to us with a tweet that just basically said, that has nothing to do with my tweet. And he said that a few times. To which we then sort of questioned, well, what was he talking about then? <laughs> and then Travis, he got really, he got really violent with us, you know. Yeah. He, he not did so not much like violent, being but more like like snarky, like you're not in business, kind of fire, like you're not understanding. Do you know what, what I call it? A, I, I call it a snarky violence because you know everyone listening to this can look at that tweet now on screen. Um, but for the, for those who who can't, he basically said <laughs> he basically said, and I laugh when I read this. I'd suggest working on your reading comprehension. This tweet was simplistic, and you still couldn't understand the message. Maybe next time, instead of exercising your freedom of speech, exercise your freedom to shut the fuck up instead. I got hurry powers, biatch. Winky now, face emoji, thumbs up emoji. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I'm I'm not going to uh, pull him up for his obvious awful grammar but he then blocked us so we couldn't respond and deleted the tweet so it just came off and i feel like <laughs> shane helms shame on you because i feel like deep down inside you agreed with us and i think it kills any quote person in the business pro wrestler anyone inside it kills them to admit when a fan's right i feel like and i feel like this is what a yeah. case of what it was you clearly understood the question your answer was exactly right on the money there was nothing confusing about it you, he stumbled. He got caught up. He didn't expect a response. He re he expected responses of people complaining about Roman fucking Reigns. Because that's what he meant yeah. in his tweet. That's what all these guys mean in their cryptic, cryptic tweet is, shut up, I'm sick of hearing you complain about Roman Reigns. Then just come out in the tweet and say, stop complaining about Roman Reigns. Don't generalize everything, <laughs> especially when you're getting called out. How yeah. long have you been in the business, Shane Helms? This isn't your second <laughs> year. You're not a blue chipper. You should know better. And I got blocked, but hey, I'm not innocent. I put out, say, dickhead things, expect dickhead responses. I deserve to get blocked. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not going to shut my mouth when you're being a jackass, so that's a case of that. And I stand by Matt's back. At the end of the day, shame on you, Shane Helms. Go get your dance pad and dance with Tank Abbott and Shannon Moore and shut up. I'm exercising my free right to bring up a terrible WCW gimmick because it sucked. Even though I got Yes, it did. Sorry. So yes, it and, <laughs> and actually, Trav, <laughs> we weren't the only ones that he had to go at. Um, I, I don't know. You know, what he was talking to someone else about. It could have been the same thing afterwards. But he basically told someone else that 
you have the freedom to mind your own business and shut the fuck up. And you should exercise that freedom for the rest of your life. And honestly, despite like what he meant by his original tweet, what a nasty, petty, bitter nobody and a disgusting human being. And from me, and I think probably from Travis as well, Gregory, Shane, whatever, fuck you. Oh, see, you made Matt turn heel already. See what you did, Shane? <laughs> And also, the consumer always had the right to change the channel, Shane, when you did a gimmick, not the hurricane. Because unless you were doing the hurricane, you sucked. And you were playing. And Gregory exactly. Holmes was a... It's awful to think he was one of the longest reigning Cruiserweight champions because you were boring. And people changed the channel when you came on. Let's move on, yeah. Matt. The things Let's that are actually on. worth our time this week. <laughs> What's going on in the UK? We have the first round of matches for the UK tournament announced, finally. And like we said last week, they will take place on June the 8th to June the 10th at the Download Festival. And some pretty... I'd say some pretty good matches here, Travis, even if, like, a lot of them are... <clears throat> sorry. Even if a lot of them are just predictable, you know, to move the bigger names on to the Albert Hall. So we've got here Jack Gallagher versus Drew Gulak. <sighs> Ashton Smith versus Joseph Connors. Connors is going all the way, isn't he? He's going into the Albert Hall. <laughs> We we can't stop him. Flash Morgan Webster versus James Drake. Kenny Williams versus Dave Mastiff. El Liguero versus Travis Banks. Zach Gibson versus Amir Jordan. Tucker versus Joe Coffey. And Jordan Devlin versus Tyson T-Bone. I think we could probably pick all the winners out of them, Travis, to move on to, like, the quarterfinals, but... Yeah, that's, I mean, Gallagher and Gulak is a toss-up for me. I'm, I would think they would make Gulak go over, though. I hope not. Like, I, I just... I don't, I don't see what he's doing in there anyway. He's got no business in this tournament. It's like putting... It's like putting John Cena in the Saudi Arabia heavyweight championship but I think tournament. Because it's WWE, I think that's exactly why they're going to do it. Because they want to... They want an American heel over there to antagonize the fans because it can't help themselves. I'm, I'm sure it killed them to have it strictly UK last year. But this year, they want. I feel like that's the gimmick he's going to do. It's going to be a mixture of that no-fly zone mixed with anti, like all Amer like America's better type gimmick he could do to get massive heel heat in the Royal Albert Hall. Because he is a great heel. <clears throat> oh, he's a great heel. But, I mean, and do you know what? I'm, a lot of people will probably love to see him you know, go to the final and lose to... I'm going to say lose to Joe Coffey, because he's been my picks even before the competitors were announced. But I will be so pissed off, Travis. Like, <laughs> we are doing... We're going to do a special feature-length, you know, post-show when we can on it. I will be so pissed off if Drew Gulak passes the, the quarterfinals. Imagine I'll be annoyed if he wins if... the whole damn thing. How you no, stop. Stop it. He just takes it all. Dear God. Brings it back home, Matt. How did that... That's something I've always wondered, too, but when we took our nine-month break, when we would see defenses like Pete Dunne against Roderick Strong or just any American, how did that always... How does that strike you guys? Because do you guys consider that title a members-only type title or just you're open to worldly, but you you get a... I don't... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. I know what you're saying. Um... I can't speak for everyone, but I know there was a... a, a, a yeah. <laughs> Here we go again, Travis. <laughs> okay. there, there was a... Uh, you know, it's a select group that consider it a members-only title. Me, personally, I just think it should be UK-only. Like, I think it cheapens it to... not Maybe not defend it against Americans or you know Australians or Canadians, etc., I just think it cheapens it when it's a constant thing, you know? If it had just been Roderick Strong, fine. He's a great competitor, put on a great match. The title had credibility coming out of it. But then, you know, it was just, you know, Adam Cole after it, and you had a few more, one or two more Americans, you know, compete. Johnny Gargano as well. Right. It, it like, honestly felt matches, like... You know. oh, they were all great matches, but... I felt like, as far as the title was concerned, it, it sort of cheapened the meaning of it. It's like, it was like the European title all over I, again. Oh, you son of a bitch. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. I was going to bring up the comparison of the, the European title and how it, I know why it was used to put on Shawn Michaels as a massive heel, but it had that, 
didn't feel right immediately on an American. And you would, yeah. I know people are going to like roast us in the comments if we don't bring up D'Lo Brown's run as a European champion, how over that got. But that was used as a gimmick prop, unlike this. This title's been treated with like prestige and how a title should be at the end of the day. It, it, it has, it has. Um, and I think that goes back to, it obviously goes back to Pete Dunne, who has treated it, you know, with nothing but respect and dignity. I think, had it been anyone else, and I've said this two weeks running now, it would have probably killed the title. I think it, because we had such a strong, respectable champion, who, who was known the world over. You know, some of some of the guys in last year's tournament weren't known the world over. Pete Dunne had done things in Japan and, you know, Canada, Australia, etc. beforehand, um, as had Tyler Bay. I think, I think had the title been on anyone else um, after May last year, <clears throat> then I think it would have, to, to a degree, it would have killed its reputation. I could, I could see that. I, I agreed with that last week. And by the way, it's raining outside. If you guys hear that in the background, all apologies can't be helped. It's like we bring up the European title, which starts raining instantly. All the potential that belt had back then just squandered. <laughs> Steve Blackman's and Perry Saturn's yeah. and fucking Midian, I think, even held that belt now. Yes, uh, Hardcore Holly. Easy. Easy. Let's not bash great wrestlers. Stop it. Either, either way, there, there's still tons more UK news this week concerning the tournament, the shows. There's mm -hmm. new, brand new uh, signings, huge signings. Let's get to all that, Matt. Um, besides the actual first round matches, what else is going on with the show? Well, um, we've had a brand, brand new match announced, a non tournament match announced for night one. Um, it will be the great Tony Storm, who, you know, is just massive over here with progress right now and all around the world. Uh, versus Killer Kelly versus Ginny versus Isla Dawn in a fatal four-way match. And the winner will advance to night two to face Shayna Baszler or Nikki Cross. We know it's going to be Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship. And the first thing I thought, Travis, like most people probably did when I saw this, was Tony Storm versus Shayna Baszler. And like, how great would that be if Tony Storm was to win it? I think we could very well see that. I think that they may do that. Actually, and it it's also it blew my mind to see Killer Kelly in there. A, she's a WXW talent, and it's cool to see them reaching out to them more. But she's also very mm -hmm. young to the business. Yes, and you know, all, all all four of them are young women. All four of them have got all the potential in the world. And I'm slightly worried that this could possibly trump the tournament itself. <laughs> right, well, it's gonna be a hard act to follow, for sure. But yeah, it the is, thing with Tony it Storm is. right now. It's hard to follow. She's main eventing shows all over the world, following Walter and Dragunov matches and killing it and getting good reactions following those guys. She's she's on a whole other level. And I think with her signing officially this week, which is what we also failed to mention, she's going to be a, mm -hmm. a, a huge star if handled right. And I think she'll be a little different from a Kyrie Sane. I think because say what you want. I think Kyrie Sane's borderline flatlined a little bit right now. I think they're going to boost to yeah. the storm majorly. They're going to do it fast. <clears throat> That'd be stupid not to. Um, and I, I, from what I've read, I believe she's on the, the Pete Dunne deal where she can go away and perform elsewhere when NXT isn't touring. Right. Um, so should, uh, should she win the title, then there's going to be no problem with her, you know, holding it for a long time. And because they tape NXT like two or three nights running, that leaves the rest of her month free to go to progress, to go anywhere else she wants. What if they would ever have the, they would ever consider releasing a UK women's title? Is that too much, or do you think that fits? Um, it depends. You, you would have to have, I think, at least ten very good UK female wrestlers right now um, to make that title float. Otherwise, it's going to be one, you know, one British woman defending it against a host of Americans, Germans, etc. Right. Yeah, they need to they need to develop their they need to find more talent, quite frankly. Yeah, they do. They need to find more talent. But that that, Travis, isn't the only match that was announced. Um we always had another match announced for night two, which is Alistair Black and Ricochet versus E C three and the Velveteen Dream. And I'm okay with this because they've they've sort of made it clear that even though it's under the banner of the you know, UK tournament, night one will be UK 
night two will be NXT. So I'm I'm okay with this. Right, right. At least they're they're not using they're not trying to make them piggyback off the NXT brand too much. No. No, they're not. And can I just say that <clears throat> for anyone that's been you know, keeping their eye on NXT, um, we have a takeover match announced, uh, Undisputed Era versus Danny Birch and Only Lorcan. I think this is going to be the title match we see at the UK tournament as well. Um, 24 hours, not 20, uh, 72 hours later, be on the Tuesday night after takeover. I can see and them I winning do... the takeover and then the Cinderella yes. upset and then losing it right back. I think that's exactly what you were thinking too, probably. No, actually, I was going to say they could, they would lose at takeover, questionable means, um, grounds for a rematch, and then win it at the Albert Hall. I think that would be, I think that would be the right way to push Danny Birch right now. And as you know, I'm a huge Danny Birch mark. If, I just if think we like, could have noticed in the past ten episodes, the man always gets brought up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I he's, he's tremendous. Good. And, and Matt he calling is, my bluff, by the way, he he wasn't thinking when I was thinking. I like it. I like, and you know what? Thinking about it, hindsight, that would that would come off so much more on television in front of a UK crowd. You know. Yeah, yeah. You you got to send us home happy, Travis. You know, um, I don't think the UK title is changing hands not yet. So I think. I think to have a Brit win a title instead of just retain, it would give the night a, you know, just a nice little boost. I think what you guys need is a little taste of American medicine, how we have to leave a show. We don't ever get to leave happy if we go to a WWE show. Why should you guys? <laughs> they, want to, they want to keep us sweet, Travis. Don't when do we get thrown a goddamn bone, for Christ's sakes, with not beautiful long Samoan hair attached to it? I mean, come on. No. Yeah, I suppose that's true, but... You've had years of of good of good show endings, you know. We that's we true. deserve something. That's true. We deserve something that's not a battle royal or, or the Bulldog. British Bulldog versus the Barbarians. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> See, we're back on the same page by the end of it. It's come full circle. Uh, we are. <laughs> what other matches going on, Matt, for this this uh, UK stuff? And we'll get the ball rolling. <clears throat> um, the only other match so far announced is Pete Dunne and Mustache Mountain versus the Undisputed Era on night one, but. Um, some more news has like, very quickly come out of this, is that Shawn Michaels will be in attendance along with Triple H in place of William Regal. And now the rumour is that Shawn Michaels will actually take over William Regal as general manager of NXT. Well, apparently Which... he's taken over the, the being Adam Cole's fucking booking agent if you see the, league, the <laughs> yes. NXT strip this week. <laughs> My God. And, do you know what? <laughs> Carry on. He's booked Adam Cole superbly. I I can't argue with that. That's the thing is, if, for anyone that saw the script leak, by the way, it was a bunch of every Adam Cole segment on that Takeover show was produced by Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Is what we're talking about. But yeah, yeah they. I wish they would produce more things in the company. You know, <laughs> quite frankly. Amen to that. And I think Adam Cole was going places. Um, and we can talk about Adam Cole because he's going to be a part of the UK tournament. So he's going to be a part of this show for the next few weeks. Um, mini Shawn Michaels. Maybe. Is that going too far? Or? No, no. It's, he's like a he's like a mixture of Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Like mixed together. A mini version. You think, I, I think he's a mixture of Seth Rollins and Shawn Michaels. I could see that too. The man has a huge head. I know that. Adam Cole's forehead is like eight <laughs> inches high. Uh, it gets him over, though. I can't, you know, it does. Working. But I'm so oh I'm God. already so excited. Just that match alone, the reaction Mustache Mountain's going to get. But in that, that's going to be a great match. I cannot wait. Yes, it will be. Hopefully, match of the night. But you, you could say that. You know what I mean? You, you could probably pick. You could probably pick the two non. Tournament matches and probably at least three quarterfinal matches, and say, take your pick for match of the night. Easily, yeah, it's a toss up, basically. Yeah. Unless I guess Joseph Connors is in it, right? <sighs> He's gonna be. There's no way they're gonna put Ashton Smith, <clears throat> who is an unknown talent in England. You know, unless you watch, I think he has been on Progress a tiny bit. Unless you, you know, you tune in regularly to progress and actively tour the indie circuit in Britain, watching you know non televised UK shows, you, you you're not going to know who he is. Um, from what I've seen and heard of him, 
he's not a great star. You know, he's okay. Joseph Collins is going to the quarterfinal. Fuck. <laughs> and do you know what? If Drew Gulak gets through, I hope Drew Gulak beats him. And then Drew Gulak can lose in the semifinals. There you go. There's Matt's bold prediction. Of mediocrity, I guess, for Matt's eyes, but there's a <laughs> prediction nonetheless. What else have we got on the rundown this week, Matt? Oh, what else have we got on the rundown? I think that's it, Travis. I think we've already done it. We got that much news under our belts. Night two. Um, I, it, it's, it's a lot of matches aren't aren't known yet, obviously, because of the tournament. Um, yes. What else is going on with night two though? Because I don't really. I'm kind of out of the loop on that one. Well, night night two is <clears throat> is going to revolve around uh, NXT. Um, the main event is, of course, going to be whoever wins the tournament versus Pete Dunne for the UK Championship. But underneath that, we're going to see the NXT Women's Title defended. We we can go we can go out on a limb now and say Nikki Cross isn't beating Shayna Baszler at Takeover. Right. So it's going to be Baszler and. And Tony Storm. They're, they're, they've not brought her in just to lose to three exactly. unknown talents. Exactly. So we're, we're getting Shayna Baszler versus Tony Storm for the NXT Women's Championship. And then we are actually getting a North uh, UK, sorry, NXT North American Championship match as well. I'm hoping it's, it's not going to be Ricochet. It's not going to be EC3 or Velteen Dream because they're booked in a different match on the same night. So I don't know. Let's 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 get your predictions, Travis, for Adam Cole's number one contender for I night two. EC3 being thrown in there, possibly. He's already booked. Oh, on the okay. Besides EC3, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question because Ricochet's tied up. EC3 is not. I know Lars Sullivan's getting the shot, right, in the title match. The main. Yeah, La- Lars Sullivan's getting uh, Alistair Black at TakeOver. I mean, there's not a lot of upper mid-card guys left, if you think about it. Um, Gargano, maybe. Gargano, maybe, but it, it's Chomp could cost him. Yeah, there you go. Gargano and the Chai, it'll just progress that feud. Adam Cole gets the win. <laughs> that way, neither guy looks weak, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I could go with that. And then, of course, we've got the NXT Tag Team Championships being defended on night two. Um, my prediction, as you've already heard, is Undisputed Era versus Birch and Lorcan. Rematch from TakeOver. And Danny Birch wins. Come on, Danny. Hopefully we don't get Fabian Eichner and Adam Cole. That would be disappointing. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I know you're so pumped. Uh, <laughs> guys, don't go anywhere. We have so much more show left to come. Um, it, we are going to Insurrection in the year 2000 this week, Matt. And it's refreshing to go to a show to not come out of it pissed off for once. Yes. And Travis and everyone listening, a show with some wrestling on it. We have Actually, not had for, that in two weeks. For its time, more wrestling than it should have had for the Attitude Era. But when we come back, we'll get right to that before we do. We're going to take a quick break right here. Slam Pigs Union Smack. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hey Colin, did you get the cardboard cutout of Console Kev? Did I ever? It's amazing! Oh, I think so too, I hate that guy. Oh, oh, uh, t- Kevin, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, you know, just eavesdropping all the, you know, the bad things you say about me. My usual Wednesday. Oh, well, did you at least prepare for the Retro Gaming Podcast? Absolutely not. Oh, god, that figures. Alright, it's okay, I'll take it from here. Basically... Uh, we pick a theme every time, and we pick a number of games based on that theme. You know, just like our first episode, where it lasted forever, and we talked about space games. Yeah, and other good, you know, all the mainstream systems and games you love, like the 3DO, the Atari Jaguar. Oh, come on! Colin, you back me up here. The 3DO is awesome, right? Mm, yeah. Oh, I thought we were friends. I mean, it's cool. Uh, oh. All right. If you want to hear three guys talk about games that are bad because JD picked them all and good games that Kevin picked, join us. Who here wants to see a bunch of nerds talking video games with a little bit of anime thrown in there? Nobody? Just me? Damn! Well, speaking of anime, we... Colin, we have an anime cast as well. Yes, we do. All retro anime. (laughs) Many of which I have never heard of myself. And I'm a weeb! 
very similar premise there. We we pick a retro anime, at least 15 years or older, and we review it every episode. We also keep up on all the modern stuff, all the seasonal things from the year. Hey, Kevin, you just got back into wrestling, right? I did. Oh my god, did you know we also have a wrestling cast that just started? I do now, because nobody tells me anything. Ah, oh, well what do you think of the big dog these days? He still sucks. Well, that's good. Well, luckily, we just don't complain about WWE stuff. We also talk about a lot of the latest and greatest from from the rising indie scene, New Japan, and Ring of Honor. I like rings and honor. Oh, well, you should definitely listen to the Red Leaf Retrocast. We have such a wide range of topics, ideas to, to discuss, and just anything to review. It's fantastic. Don't you guys think so? It's all right. Absolutely. And thanks again for the Sailor Moon episode. That's got me a lifetime supply of salt for my fries. From the fans. Ha! That's the Red Leaf Retrocast. We are back! Slam Pigs Union Smack right here at Binky TMD. Matt Tennant, welcome back. It's that time, my friend, to get in the DeLorean travel back to the year... 2000 this time going back to the good old attitude era like we said before the break it's time for another actually i don't think we've ever reviewed an insurrection pay-per-view first of all what does the word yeah. insurrection mean Fuck because that is a random ass <laughs> word to make your pay-per-view name <laughs> do you know what? i always uh, understood it as like backlash you know it's like a rebellious <clears throat> a rebellious thing but i've never looked it up travis it took two minutes wouldn't it lazy but <laughs> i gotta feel like it's the opposite of resurrection but either way it sounds cool and i guess that's why they use it it makes a good logo with all the x's in there uh it does it does and can i just say what doesn't make a good logo is the subtitle to this pay-per-view london bridge isn't the only thing that's falling down what the fuck does that mean i would have fired every single person in my promo department had they put that promo sheet in front of me as the, the tagline what is this uh <laughs> yeah get out of here <laughs> Even worse, um, the the pay per view cover, uh, the pay per view poster background has a picture of Big Ben in London, just a bit lopsided, you know, just a bit falling down behind Shane McMahon. That was this, it. This is a year before nine eleven struck, so if this this pay per view is like a year later, no way would that have been the poster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No way. <laughs> And I bring up, you know, the X's make a good logo. That's one thing about the logos and just the, the stages. There's X's everywhere for this show. Just Oh, th- there is. But I will just say, like, lazy, lazy bastards. Yeah. The setting for this, it was the Raw set. It was. It was the, it was the 2000 Raw set with no graphics, no expense spared. How fucking lazy do you have to be? Not one fuck given with the stage design for the show. They didn't even nope. roll out, like, a, a British car or put out a phone booth for this, like they would do, to, like, make... Nope, not one network. thing. Just just give them the raw set. Fuck it. We don't got time for that, pal. Um, <laughs> this, is, this show took place one week after Backlash 2000, Matt, where The Rock had just mm-hmm. defeated Triple H, finally won the title back. Austin, with his beard gut and all, came back for the first time since his neck injury after getting hit by a car. Then he'd disappear again until, like, October. He'd come back then, but he wasn't on the show... There were mentions no. of him throughout the show, and it seemed like the fans thought he would come out, but say la vie. Um, Backlash 2000, one of the best Attitude Era pay-per-views, in my opinion. I, yes, I enjoyed that show. The cre- that was in Washington, D.C. That I, I kicked myself in the ass looking back. I was 16 years old. I could have gone to that show. I just didn't go. Um, I, the crowd was <laughs> broken. Out, I remember. But Austin's return on Backlash was one of the loudest things I've ever heard to this day. Do you know what? I, and I also think there was expectation for him here. I think we've just seen him on Backlash, and I got a feeling like a lot of the night, especially the main event and the last few minutes of it, I th- I feel like this crowd expected Austin, and then we're just like, oh, well, where the fuck's he gone? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. What I mean, t- tons of guys were over on the show, treated like Moses parting the seas. We'll get to that, <laughs> yes. but it, it is safe to say. I've never seen, on any of the shows we've reviewed, a crowd red hot for everybody. Everybody yeah. on a show. It didn't matter. From Crash Holly to The Rock. They were all getting those reactions. And it just speaks to the yeah. time this took place, too, I feel like. Yeah, starved. Again, we, you know, apart from the WWE shows, we were starved of wrestling. And we were just happy to see anyone. Perry Saturn. We were happy to see Perry Saturn. Who can say that? 
Yeah. Yeah. What what American audience can sit there and go? I was so glad to see Perry Saturn in the ring tonight. I enjoyed Perry against the flock. That was okay. <laughs> I'm like the one guy. Okay. Fine. Moving on. <laughs> Matt, let's get in there. Let's go to kick off the pay per view. What did the show kick off with? <clears throat> the show kicked off with from the Earl's Court Exhibition Center. Too cool versus the Radicals. And I fucking love Too Cool, Travis. Like, I, I always felt like they should have been bigger. Well, if, you know, a bit... if Brian Christopher would have kept his hands out of the cookie jar and not got themselves some drug suspensions, <laughs> they might have, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't have seen him eclipsing Edge and Christian. Um, but Scotty Too Hotty, uh, before this match, and just before Backlash, I seem to recall, Brian Christopher was injured. And that led to Scotty Too Hotty. He'd just come off a light heavyweight championship reign. But I say reign. Is seven days a reign? I'm not sure it is. For the uh, Attitude no, Era, it was like a Bruno reign. So. Oh, I suppose you're right. But it was ten days, not seven. I correct myself. Um, he, he actually defeated Dean Malenko for that title on April the 17th, Raw, and lost it back to him on April the 27th, SmackDown. <clears throat> And that, of course, led to their backlash match, which I have to say, very, very underrated match. Very underrated. I think Scott Taylor, Scotty Too Hotty, whatever, is just underrated performer in general because before he took on that gimmick, he was <laughs> in too much. They were that, but before that, he was in their first light heavyweight tournament and he was having some pretty yeah. good matches. But he was a he was an enhancement guy in that company for the late '90s and the better part of his career until he just broke through with that silly move that just got him over. Yeah. And that's all it took then. That's all it took. <clears throat> Is that still is that all not... it takes, you feel like, in modern wrestling? I still feel like it is. Look at Rusev Day. That's, it only takes one silly little thing and run with it. I mean, to a degree, yes. It depends on the wrestler. You know, I think, you know, Otis... What the fuck's his name? Otis I can't Kozovich. pronounce it. That's the one. He does it now. He's over with it. Um, but I think, like, you have to be a lovable wrestler now to get a, a stupid gimmick like that over. Right. You know, if Roman Reigns came out and did the worm, can you see everyone going, oh, I was wrong about him? <laughs> Maybe. No. The fans are so no. Cool. Who knows no. anymore? I will say, <clears throat> standout things in this match. And for what it was, not a bad tag match. Um, yeah. the, the Radicals, they didn't get a good reaction, but they were meant to. They were the heels. They had just turned on Cactus Jack like a month or two before. This is <laughs> when... Too Cool was at the height of their popularity with Rikishi. By far, they just gotten the stamp on a Raw a couple months before this, tagging with The Rock in like a five-man tag match, main eventing Raw. That I think that's the match that finally put Too Cool over the top. Over the top, and I totally yeah. agree. They could have been. They did hold the titles eventually, but it should have been way longer. But look at the tag teams at the time, and I, I kind of get it. The other hand, I kind of don't. It's kind of whatever. And plus, with Brian Christopher's outside <laughs> recreations, who knows what could have been? But I did notice. I have on my sheet. Malenko is God sign in the crowd. Yes. Somebody was the well. biggest goddamn D Malenko fan in the crowd that night. Was <clears> it and you? do you know what? <laughs> I wish. Do you know what? We all should have been. Because looking back on it now, what an underrated performer. Could be one of the most underrated performers ever. I can <clears> like, for for all the people, you know, and I'm one of them that said when I saw Rey Mysterio for the first time against like Psychosis, it blew my mind, right? But Dean Malenko was right there too, having those matches like Great American Bash that you'd never seen with Mysterio. It doesn't get talked about on that same level as Mysterio for just innovative wrestling in American yeah. television. And not just Mysterio, like some of his matches, not, I'm not going to say all of them <clears throat> because some of them were a car crash, but some of his matches with Chris Jericho in WCW, wow, like. They were amazing. I mean, every match I feel like you have with Eddie Guerrero, ECW, <clears throat> WCW, they were always tremendous. Every time. Yeah. They were I also, I feel like, I feel like Dean Malenko was born, like, nine years too late. Oh, yeah. Well, mate, no, no, maybe nine years too early, however you figure it. Because if he'd have been around in the WWF in 92, 93, can you imagine the, the matches he could have had with Bret Hart for the... The WWF Championship. Speed up the timeline. Imagine as popular as, as and as important as in ring is now to get over with the fans. Imagine him like in his prime now, and going around the world with like Kenny Omega. Imagine those fucking matches. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even on SmackDown with Styles, Pete Dunne. You know. Safe to say, timeless performer, Dean Malenko. Yes. Just any era, I feel like you could fit him in there somewhere. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. 
But uh, yeah, too cool getting the win here. Um, and this also this there was a little bit of friction with the radicals before this. They had they had mentioned during this. Um, I don't yeah. was this the official split? Because after the match, the radicals had a tussle and they beat up each other. They do. Um, Chris Benoit had actually walked away from the radicals <laughs> before this. Um, Malenko, Guerrero, Saturn, th- they were like at the end. I think there was a raw a week or two after this where it sort of broke up but they they got back together after this and then broke up again so so you can say this is the end of the radicals because nothing honestly Travis nothing that happened after this with them was at all entertaining nothing was consequential except like all that came out of the radicals after this was Mama Sita, honestly because Chris Benoit kind of stagnated for the rest of 2000 until he yeah. got in he got that neck injury and then he was out till like 2002 yeah, yeah. I mean, um, he, he, I mean, he had that great ladder match against Chris Jericho at the Royal Rumble, right. two thousand and one, um, and two thousand and one King of the Ring as well. They, him and they Jericho just, and Austin. They just turned him uh, babyface uh, at WrestleMania two thousand one against Angle, and I feel like he was finally yeah. getting there. And then, unfortunately, after around like King of the Ring time, right? He, like you're saying, he got injured, and then his yeah, start to one. And they brought him back as a heel. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, speaking of heels, here's a guy that the littlest reaction on the entire show, the shortest, not the shortest match, if you count arm wrestling a match, Bull Buchanan, out of nowhere, gets singles match against Kane, Matt. Yeah, well, what can you say? Um, they needed filler. They needed some filler, and I don't, I don't know where they got Kane from. Because he was injured before this. You know, Kane wasn't a backlash. He was coming off of a hand injury. And he wouldn't actually appear on Raw until May the 29th. Like, three weeks later. Just so, to appease, just to send you guys home happy, I guess, like you said. There you go. You got yeah. your Kane. You got your Kane they, they, for three minutes and 31 seconds. <laughs> they thought, no Americans are going to see this show. Because that was actually on the poster. Like, yeah. never seen in the USA. Exactly. They thought, Who, who's going to know? Throw <laughs> Kane in there. And, I mean, what, what, what can you say? Like, Kane's Kane, fine. But Bull Buchanan, Travis, it's like, he was he was in the Truth Commission in 98. Yeah, Recon, that is Sniper, where, one of them. Yeah, and then when the Truth Commission ended, do you remember that tag team with Sniper? They yeah, call themselves just, Armageddon. They just it, wear like regular street clothes. They didn't even bother with the gimmick. Yeah, like, didn't right bother. The not, not. They were in the WrestleMania Tag Team Battle Royal. I think is the last I saw them. They were just in like <laughs> yeah, teams. and then they went back to Ohio Valley Wrestling for a year and a half. <clears throat> so, say what you want about impressed. Paul Buchanan. Awful on a mic, but he was very agile for a big man. Just. I don't, nothing about him really jumped off the screen, I think is what it was. He was the stereotypical guy to take the fall. And I think like, and everybody says not everybody can be the champion, not, you know, that, that was his job. And yeah, I feel like yeah. he did his job well, especially here. It was a squash match, guys. Um, it was a squash uh, match. Um, but what, what do you expect with, he, he was basic jobber for the time and he just aligned himself with big boss man as well. So, and speaking of that, you were talking about like the history on the match. They really dug deep in the, the, the time machine at, at this point to build up why they're having the match. They, they showed a shot from raw from like, it felt like months ago. They're like, this is when they hurt Kane, <laughs> by the way, if you remember, it just felt random. Yeah. Like a piss poor excuse to have the match. Like just have the match at that point, you know? Um, yeah. What I mean, it, we, we didn't need the match. Um, but I don't, I don't know. You can't say much about this match that would flatter it. It was a squash. It was just to, you know, appease fans. And Paul Bearer, Travis, who was this man in 2000? I'm only half the man I used to be. Paul Bearer, <laughs> uh, this is right after, I think, his first surgery, uh, obviously. Very, yeah. very, it was always weird when he wore the all red. It kind of came off like they were ripping off Sinister Minister. And it's Paul Bear's baby face <laughs> again after all this stuff. This was a very confusing time. That they just given up on consistent consistency in Paul Bear's character storyline story arc. Whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and cheap plug, Mick Foley style. You can read all about that in my new book. So there you go. Um, there you go. The fucking weight jokes, Travis. How many did Jerry Lawler get in before Kane got in the ring? I'd say Dear a good, God Almighty, a good thirty-two, probably. There were a lot. 
Oh my God, I would agree with that. And Paul Mills <laughs> came out when he was still alive and shoots after that and saying how that would hurt his feelings when they would put that. And that was that was Vince putting that in because Vince always yeah. ripped him backstage. He would always tease him with chocolate cake and just kind of a dick. But we've, <laughs> we've seen this time and time again, like not just with Paul Bear, Paul Heyman. Like he noticeably lost weight <clears throat> a few years ago. And yet they just had Jerry Lawler on the mic, just bashing him and, you know, call him a hippo and... Vince hates fat people, Matt. What can you say? Look at look at the stuff with yeah. Nia and Alexa recently. What was the main focal point of that? Oh, and Nia's fat. And no, Alexa way. brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after this, it's... Kane would... Kane would go on to have, you know, a decent main event run. He was at King of the Ring with Rock and Undertaker fighting for the WWE title. And then another heel turn by Kane on Undertaker at SummerSlam, which was just pointless. Um, and then Bob Buchanan, right to censor. There you go. <laughs> right to censor, but I was laughing at what's after right to censor when he was B-squared, right by John oh. Cena's side. Do you know what? I didn't even write B-squared down because I've tried to... I've just tried my hardest to forget it. Well, you so, see, that's why I'm here, Matt, every week, to remind you of the oddities and the mishaps of pro wrestling. Yes. So if, if when we're off air, Travis, if you give me your address, I'll send you the therapy bills to that a bit later on. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, somebody tell Road Dog he's a heel, because up next, Road Dog went against Bradshaw, and that's what struck me in this. This is right at the time when DX... They reformed, right? Everybody knows the, the McMahon-Helmsley alliance in 2000 was running strong. And they made it one big stable, a bunch of heels with DX, which I was fine with. But I'm not yeah. fine with stoned Road Dog forgetting he's a fucking <laughs> heel and tagging fans on the way down, hand high five, pandering. What the fuck? There's my Jim yeah. Cornette. What the fuck? He got it out of me. It's my turn to be pissed off. This was ridiculous. Just the, the nonchalant, we're in the UK, and I'm high as a kite. It doesn't matter. I hate seeing this on these shows, these these throwaway shows in the UK. Well, and you know what? Bradshaw didn't help either because he came out looking like a heel. Like, couldn't give a fuck. Do not want to be here. Let's get this over with. And every house show match they could have probably ever had. This was stiff. It was horrible. It was just... Piss break. Piss break. This... And what the fuck was the ref doing, can I just ask? Farouk attacks Road Dog. Um, in the middle of the match, where's the disqualification? Just sends him back to the locker room. Yep. Like, these limeys won't know the difference between the rules. Just go. <laughs> British rules. It's British rules. It's what it is. Dear um, God. <clears throat> I noticed that too. I was like, oh, okay. This is also the era, too, where they didn't do a lot of DQ. WWF, not WCW. WCW was DQ City all the time. Yeah. But I feel like they'd always, they'd want a decisive winner. Or it's tough now. It's the Attitude Era. There's got to be a winner. They would always, I mean, they ripped off ECW with this lax rule shit. Let's say what they did. That's exactly what they did when they did yeah. stuff like this. Um, and do, do you know what? Saying that, Travis, <clears throat> you know, doing the research for my book, another cheap plug, there was an awful lot of no contests as well. Like, matches just... No DQ, no count out finishes, but n no contests. Like, right. I was staggered going back through the history books just to see how many matches just had no finish whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got uh, certain guys got in bigger, bigger matches on this, got clean wins, but that was more to progress storylines. And guys that were defeated in that took the fall, shouldn't have been in the match in the first place. But yeah, I agree. There, there was a lot of schmozzes on this. Yeah, and this this was really the end of uh, the Road Dog character. <clears throat> you know, this was I think this was probably his last hurrah in wrestling. I don't know whether you'd agree with me, but like I mean, before the New Age Outlaws were were done, Billy Gunn was injured. You know, he he was injured either at or just after um, the Raw Rumble. They cobbled Road Dog together with X Pack. Didn't work under the DX name. It was just a cheap a cheap rip off. And then, what after this, he went on to <laughs> he went on to K Quick <laughs> wearing overalls and doing rap songs with our truth. Yeah, it. I gotta agree. This was the this was the end. And I feel like when they brought in all four of those guys from WCW, that didn't help either because before this, Road Dogg was like an IC champion and a solid upper mid card guy. Yeah. But it was also at a time where they didn't have a lot of those guys, so they had to take chances with guys like Road Dogg, and that's what made him stand out more. 
And I think that when you got a Chris Benoit, what do you need a road dog in there in the IC title match or something for? I feel like that. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And I yeah. feel like it had its course, too. I really do. Even though the fans were still quoting along with this, even though it was a heel, and it seemed like it was also in the UK, and like you said earlier, you guys were starved more when we came over when they came over there. So, yeah. It, you know, but over here, it was, it was <clears> beyond stale. It was time for something else. People had seen that act as a heel or a face. I just think it was done. Yeah, it was. And then we've got that famous Road Dog WCW story, Travis, where he was released from WWE in 2001 and turned up on the last Nitro looking for work, only to find Vince had bought the fucking company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That amused me. And yeah. We're ready to start, basically. And now he writes SmackDown, if you can call some of it writing. And we all know from this, nothing but bigger things for the team of APA. They would get ultra popular in 2001. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. something weird happened. They kind of, they just didn't know what to do with those guys. And they stagnated until Bradshaw cut his hair and looked weird at the very end of the APA run in like 04. And then obviously JBL, <laughs> the massive run as the heel champion on SmackDown. We all know what JBL and, and Farouk, obviously Hall of Famer, all that good stuff. And I'm sure JBL, yeah. most definitely, it's got to be, it feels like every year he's got to be inducted in the Hall of Fame now. I would agree. I would definitely agree. And for years, Travis, I've been saying that, you know, JBL, not a good wrestler. All right. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say, what a brilliant, what a title run. Like, he was crap in the ring to a degree. But fuck, he kept that title relevant on SmackDown in 2004. Yeah. Let's not forget. He was Where tremendous. Until, he was a tremendous hero. And I think you know, the same people that always bash his wrestling <clears throat> ability, they'll praise New or All Japan or New Japan matches with Stan Hansen. It's the same style. It's the same. Yeah. He, he just took that and, and modernized the Stan Hansen style. So I have really, I, I enjoy seeing that style, that hard hitting, big hoss shit kicker style sometimes when it's, when it's called yeah. for. Exactly. And for those who want to bash JBL's title run, first take into consideration that there was no one else. Eddie Guerrero wasn't up to it, you know, as much as people loved Eddie Guerrero, he wasn't up to it in 2004. He, if I'm right in saying, requested to drop the title because he couldn't take the pressure. Exactly. You and know? he also did not, did not want to be a heel ever because after his success as that run as a babyface, he never wanted to be a heel again because of his merch sales. Because I, I remember yeah. listening to a podcast or whatever saying that. And then when they turned him heel, it didn't make him very happy. Like a year later, exactly. with Dominic custody stuff with Eddie. <laughs> Can we just forget that happened, Travis? That I try to every day. Every horrendous. Day. But JBL, who else was there? Undertaker was, you know, he was coming in and out with injuries. JBL had the Undertaker's backing. Yeah, and that's some backing to have backstage. If, if you've not got Vincent Mann's backing, you want Mark Calloway's backing. And he had it. You know, and his, um, his matches weren't great. With some wrestlers, the storylines weren't great, granted. But I will always stand by the fact that you know JBL kept that title relevant until John Cena was ready. Exactly, and that was a perfect guy for Cena to take it off of, and obviously it worked. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. I, it was, I it was like modern, modern day million dollar man as champion. Exactly, and they tried to even recapture that with Del Rio, and at first it worked, but it just. I, it didn't have the legs that a JBL or a DiBiase had because they had a ton more charisma than Dorio. That's it. And JBL was uh, <clears throat> in Heat. Uh, he was a Triple H. You won, You would pay to see him get beat. So people bitch and moan all you want. But JBL was, for those reasons, a fucking great champion. In this time, you talk about people paying what they want. In this time in pro wrestling, 2000, these years... People definitely paid for some for some TNA on these shows, and that's what was up next. Uh, 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 let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've actually missed out the Vincent Mann promo. Oh, which that's right. Pretty good. Damn it. Okay, another yeah. tremendous Vincent Mann hates Europe yeah. promo, basically. <laughs> yeah. Another Vincent Mann says, thanks for your cash, from, uh, England. Now, fuck you. That, that was the Vince McMahon promo. But no, but I actually, what stood out to me, I liked how, I actually liked how Vince handled it this time. It wasn't just a carbon copy paste of like No Mercy or the last one we reviewed. He put a little twist on it. He brought up the title match later on, which is the main event. Spoiler alert, mm -hmm. The Rock going against Triple yeah. H and Shane in a handicap match saying, 
Rock doesn't want you people to know. He wants to have this match here, because when he loses, he knows no one in America will see it, because everyone knows nothing consequential happens in England, pal. It was great. I loved every yeah. second of it. It was great heel work. And I wish he would get the the praise. He did. I mean, you know, we can shoot him down in the modern day for the booking and the way the company and storylines are going, blah, blah, blah. But he was one of the, the greatest heels of all time. Und- and also, Travis, what a, what a brilliant talker for someone who was such a terrible commentator. Yeah, who would have known? Go back exactly. and watch him in All-Star Wrestling interview in, like, Andre the Giant and see that that would be the guy cutting those promos. You, I would call you a liar, me, Gene. Right to your face. <laughs> right to your face. It's tremendous. Cannot praise this anymore. One of the must-sees on the show is this promo, by far. Yes, exactly. And can I just say, the uh, the little pervert side of me, another must thing, we, Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> fabulous Moolah, I knew it! The fucking Fabulous Moolah in that Leah. <laughs> right, no. Hot little Stephanie McMahon. What, 23, 24? Fabulous Moolah wow. saying, look at my hot little number, darling. Want to see me try it on? <laughs> it's funny you should mention the fabulous Moolah, Travis, because I think she had the line of the night, possibly possibly the line of the entire year, in her and Terry Runnell's backstage interview with Michael Cole. Um, I don't know whether you caught it, but Moolah said to Michael Cole, I've been working at every morning and every night. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I the guess they were long Cole's hours face. she was booking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably night shift workers for both both shifts, but... People are probably wondering why the hell we brought up Fabulous Moolah. No, she's actually in the segment, guys. It was the cat yes, against Terry is. Runnels in an arm wrestling match. Fabulous Moolah in the corner of Terry Runnels, Mae Young in the corner of Cat. Coming off the uh, awful, God, ugh, just the feud from WrestleMania 2000 and Backlash and all this bullshit. And not, and, and not, not just that, Travis. Like, if they're getting Miss Kitty, she was women's champion in 99. They, they put the belt on this woman. Don't ever talk about me bringing up bad memories again. Ever. I never want to hear you do that. <laughs> Sorry. Again. Well, here's, here's a few more for you. And if you complain about today's women division, just skip back to 1999 to see the likes of evening gown matches, chocolate pudding matches, Miss Royal Rumble swimsuit contests, and the always wonderful Lim- uh, Lumberjill Snow Bunny match. Yeah. And that was all before she lost the title to Harvey Whippleman, dressed as a woman, Hervina. The so, James Ellsworth of the Attitude Era, right there. Yes. Oh, I don't think I'd go that far. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Man. Dear God. Everything went too far in all this. And what is there to say besides Terry looks smoking hot? I mean, they, this mm-hmm. was a waste of time. Jerry Lawler was a pervert. It looked like his hand was <laughs> in his tights playing with himself when his wife was out there. It's, there's nothing to say. You've seen this a million times on Attitude yeah. Era shows. This was a shit. This was softcore porn, basically. It was, and you, you, you could just picture Vince McMahon and Gerald Briscoe not being able to get up from the table after after Terry stripped down to that, that skimpy all-in-one number, and then tore the cat's bra off. And if anyone is interested in how this ended, then I don't know why, but Mae Young poured water. Uh, yeah, Mae Young, I'm right, and I poured water all over Terry, and the cat won. There's your women's division in 2000. Well, we know Pat Patterson didn't have any problems standing up on the table. He was probably like, oh, boy, the next match. Let's get the guys back out. I'm sorry. Um, it was what it was. Hopefully, we never have to talk about any of that again. It's something I don't want to talk about either. It's something I don't even want to talk about their history. That's how nauseating this whole segment was. Um, let's get to back to some some why we're here, though. Some, I guess, decent stuff by the end of this. Um, Rikishi and Shokishi going against the Dudley boys here. The Dudley boys actually turning babyface a week before this on SmackDown, if I'm correct? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think you are correct. Um, but they played the heels here, you know. Um, <clears throat> however, played the heels, treated like heroes. So, yeah. I don't know whether... I don't know, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going horse again. <clears throat> I don't know whether Vince thought we didn't watch his shows over here, or we were so backward in our technology that we didn't get them. But... We see, Vince, we see these things. We know they're, uh, we know they're baby faces, so why put them against two more baby faces and have them act like heels? 
I don't know. You would see that sometimes. You would see it more in this era. In any time in WWF before this, they hardly ever did like heel versus heel or baby face versus baby. And when they did it, it meant something. You saw that all the time in the Attitude Era. And I think also just days before they had turned babyface, maybe they had thought that A, not all the people in that crowd had seen that episode of SmackDown yet, or just just B, it was already advertised. Um, card subject to change, yeah. all that kind of shit. Um, this was also the time, though, and as on fire as the Dudley Boys, though. Let's go on the other end of the spectrum. Hollywood Big Show. This was his, This <laughs> he was impersonating Hogan and just everybody. And it, the Hogan impersonation oh, yeah. at Backlash a week before was great. I actually enjoyed that at the time. Yeah, um, what wasn't so great, Travis, I think you'll probably agree, as a viewer of this era, was uh, Shonen the Barbarian. Yeah, that, was, that made Hang it. Hang on, the Berserker, worst. and the, the big Shobowski, which is Val Venus, and just all the rest of them. They were, some of them were just so shitty and so pointless. It's like, do, do you think Paul White won the world champion, the WCW world championship in 96, 95, 96, and thought, oh, do you know what, in five years' time, I'm going to be in a massive thong dressed as a fat Samoan. Woohoo! And the sad thing was, all this happened, this whole change in his character, because of his Saturday Night Live appearance. Yeah. You know? He did Saturday Night <laughs> yeah. Live, he lost as a heel at WrestleMania, then it was like, just poof, now you're a big, goofy comedy guy we're supposed to love, after you've been one of the top heels, and a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even more baffling, they just like, extracted him from this, this gimmick with no warning at all after... Um, uh, actually, after this, I will say, because, you know, he went on to a feud with Shane McMahon at Judgment Day. And then Just, it was back to OVW, right? Or Deep South? Developmental? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Developmental and to... Well, the real reason he was sent down there was to lose some weight and get himself in a better cardiovascular right, right. situation. But We would see him come back at uh, the 01 Rumble, I think, was his first appearance, as a surprise entrance. On, and he didn't look like he was following the diet regimen very well. He had, like... His 99 <laughs> big show shirt on that looked like a bib on an infant, pretty much, if I remember yeah. correctly. <laughs> yeah. He, he, but, this was the time he definitely struggled with his weight, and he wasn't very liked backstage. He's come out and said in interviews, like, Taker hated him at this time because he came in cocky because he had been pushed as a rookie in WCW. He didn't know any better, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but, you know, stop smoking 40 a day and get on the treadmill. It's not that hard, surely. <laughs> I miss when but, Big Show came out smoking <laughs> cigarettes in the NWO. I do miss that. For no fucking reason either. It's like he's a big guy that smokes. That's the gimmick. Um, another big guy. Who's argue with him? <laughs> another big guy. His partner was doing much better for himself, momentum wise. One of the biggest faces at the time was Rikishi Fatu. And who would have thought yes. when he debuted in late '99? <laughs> I just thought it was going to be a nothing character. But man, that gimmick caught fire like nothing I'd ever seen. Just yeah. We talk um, about well, silliness. Like, one little thing. All it took were ass cheeks, man. Let's be exactly. real. Exactly. And look how far he came, Travis, in his career. Like. From a head shrinker to that terrible fucking mid nineties like rap gimmick. Make it a which spot too. Yep. <laughs> which he didn't, funnily enough. And and then to this. Um and I will say that two thousand was by far by far for me his best year in wrestling. Oh most he, definitely. Most Before they fucked it up and turned him heel by the end of two thousand. Yeah, and had him had him as the, the one who ran Austin down. That that never one, so of, one of the me. worst decisions for a guy's just booking direction ever, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it was it almost no like it, it was almost like who have we got sitting around the locker room that's got nothing to do? Ah, oh, Rikishi, up your step. And what came out of it? He fell off of a cell into a truck full of cow manure, right? I love that, by the way. I Don't do too. But I'm that, just saying Travis. that was the highlight, <laughs> and then it was like off to European title city you go against Val Venus, Rikishi, or something. See you later. Yeah. And by, and by yeah. the end of 2001, <clears throat> what happened to Rikishi, Rikishi's momentum? It had completely gone, and by 2002, he was a job guy. Yeah. Oh, job guy. Rico, tag team champions. He Hello. Was a job guy. <laughs> job guy. <laughs> and then he lost to, like, Charlie Haas or something. Is that star yeah. power to you, Matt? It is not star power to me. <laughs> what is star power, though, is, like, yeah. his mid-2000 run, Travis. Wow. Like, intercontinental champion. What a King of the Ring tournament he had as well. Like, I know Kurt won it, but he was the standout star for me, Rikishi, by far. And then, 
And then that fucking brilliant match with Val Venus over the Intercontinental title at Fully Loaded, the cage match. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I haven't seen that in a long time, actually. I should go back. We, we should we, we should review Fully Loaded. Wasn't that just, like, boring them. Val Venus with, like, techno music and Trish Stratus? He was like, yeah, no it, 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 and sh- short hair Val Venus, I believe uh, it was. <laughs> but do you know what? <laughs> what a match. And you know, this, this isn't fully loaded, but fuck it. If anyone wants an Attitude Era pay-per-view other than Backlash or the Rumble, fully loaded, it's fucking brilliant. There you go. Maybe in the future we'll get to that. July's due yes. next month, so there you go. Um, there you by go. the end of this match, um, the match, the actual match, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's exactly what you would think it would be. It could have been on Raw. Um, Sunday Night Heat. That's... Maybe. It, was, it was a Sunday night heat match, wasn't it? Like, I'd, I wouldn't have put this on Raw, personally. <clears throat> I'd have put it on... I mean, I could have seen him putting on... This is three know. of the hottest acts in the company at the time. And by the end of this, after the match, with the little dance number, you definitely saw how over all those guys were. I feel like it definitely would have made Raw over... Maybe a heat main event, I could have seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, double stink face. Can you imagine being shoved into Big Show's crack? No. I can't. I don't want to. Oh, I feel sick. Especially Um, after wrestling for how long did this match go? (laughs) Like 12 minutes, didn't it? Something something along those lines. I didn't get the time. A lot of people say Devon. No, he's not the Gennetti. He's always outshadowed by Bubba Ray. But quite frankly, Bubba carried the team as far as charisma. Uh, It was Bubba. Just the silliness and dancing. Did Devon have anything to do, like, from 2000 to when they split in 2002, other than to get the tables? And he he had that little bit, uh, both WrestleMania and SummerSlam, where he was afraid of heights. Like, did he have anything else to do until they made him Reverend uh, Devon testify? Just just the uh, what's up thing. And then they never bothered, because they'd always talk about Bubba Ray's character and how we would see later on the show, too, with tables and stuff, how he would just, like, get a wrestling boner or something, something weird, and they'd focus on his stare, but it was, ne- like, they would never show Devon. So in a, re- a way, <laughs> yeah. you're right. And in no disrespect, it's just how they presented it. Yep, it was. And But then again, oh, Devon what didn't have the most charis- charisma, you know? He didn't have the best wrestling ability of the two, for me. So maybe it was best he was kept in the shadows, because I think he would have highlighted a, a flaw in the team. Had they pushed him to the front. Plus, who the hell can follow Bubba Ray Dudley dancing like that? Like he did with Rikishi. Do you know? Do you know? If I ever met Bubba Ray Dudley and they said to me, you're allowed one question, it would be, why do you dance like Carlton from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air? <laughs> and then you'd duck immediately. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> duck, yeah, I'd duck. Yeah. I'd be out the door before he answered. What do you mean, duck? You'd be still asking it <laughs> while you're leaving. And like he wouldn't even hear the end of the question because like the door would shut while you're exiting. Um, but obviously, guys, we're talking about two cool ran down after the match for a celebration. Um, yeah. Dudley boys were trying to exit. It seemed like they were just going to celebrate with Shokishi. No, they stopped. But but Ray Dudley put on Rikishi's glasses, these hypnotic glasses we've seen time and time again. I always love that. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. Puts mm-hmm. them on, yeah. sees the light, dances away like two cool Scorpio <laughs> taking kids back to school when they cut class, and that was it. It was it was, was fine. It. The crowd loved it. The flash bulbs were insane throughout the whole show, actually. Yes. Um, and can we just skip back to the end of the match? Uh, Edge ran in with the spear on Bubba Ray Dudley, allowing Big Show to win with the choke slam. And I'm only bringing that up because it has a little to do with like the tag team title match later in the show. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it made sense. It didn't make the Dudleys look weak either. As brand new baby, yeah. like you know, and it's what heels should do. Um, that lead us next, um, before the Kurt Angle Chris Benoit match. Was this the vignette with Chris Benoit? Um, it was the vignette for Kurt Angle tour in London. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, book, yeah. Book signings and and I, I didn't note this down, Travis, and I wish I had. But there was a blue guy, not a blue guy. <laughs> well, London weather maybe he was, but there was a bloke in a blue sort of vest top, bold, and he was shouting something at the camera that really annoyed me, and I didn't note it down, and I wish I had. I remember that guy, but I don't know what he was saying. I was like, why is that guy so mad? <clears throat> but it was weird, too, how they... 
they picked Kurt Angle to be the guy showing this because he was going around like he was like running for president, like he was the ultimate or prime minister, yeah. or whatever, just the ultimate baby face. Um, like Bob Backlund running for president in two thousand. But yeah, he was. Was it two thousand? I can't remember. Uh, 95. 95. Two thousand. Where the fuck did I get two thousand? Because we're talking about two thousand, I guess, right now. Um, I suppose. Kurt Angle. And he was. He did manage Kurt Angle, didn't he, at the beginning of two thousand? I think so. I think you're right. I didn't even remember Going that. into No Way Out, I think he did. That's right. That's right. Um, Kurt Angle, obviously, what can you say about him springboarding just how fast he took to pro wrestling? Yeah. Um, he, he would go on to win King of the Ring after this. He had just had... Well, he had lost both of his titles at WrestleMania 2000. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. And them titles sort of slumped after they came off of Kurt Angle because they went to Benoit and Jericho and then they swapped hands like three times in the space of a month. At least, I'd have to say. And again after this as well, Travis. So, because Chris Benoit won the Intercontinental title from Chris Jericho. Um, let me get this right. Diddly do, diddly do. No, he lost the Intercontinental title to Chris Jericho on May the 2nd. This was May the 6th. And then he won it back from him on May the 8th. So, well done for shitting on the title again, Vince. <laughs> And speaking of Chris Benoit, he had suffered a nasty eye injury, and he did an interview Ooh, with yes. people. And I know we don't want to bring up what happened in real life, but this came off a little bit creepier. It was a little hard to watch, but I did it. I rolled up my sleeves, and I did it. He looked demonic <laughs> in this with the way his eye was all mangled. And... Yes, he did. Um, and also, you winced at the flying head, but knowing you know, what shots like that did to him. But, but we, we, we're not going to delve into that. Because, do you know what, Travis? People don't talk anymore about what a great wrestler Chris Benoit was. It's all about what happened. Exactly. And, and we're definitely going to focus on his in-ring and all yes. that stuff. Yes. Uh, this match was preceded, preceded, yeah, preceded by Crash Holly Telegraph in the next match for us. Thank you very much, Crash. When he, he stomped to the ring with the hardcore title and said... I want to challenge a British a British man, but there are none about. Well, that was so rectified after this. So thanks for ruining that crash, you dick. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just get annoyed with. Yeah, they like were that. kind of just like fuck Chris Benoit's entrance. Here's Crash Holly real quick. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Wankers. Yeah. Um, Kurt yeah. Angle had a decent speech at the beginning. A decent little heel. We saved you in World War Two speech. Written by Vince McMahon, no doubt. Um, and do you know what? The thing I've got written down is he was a great talker at one point, Kurt Angle. And that, like, watching his 2000 stuff back sort of highlights what he's lost today. Well, I mean, a million concussions and stuff. Maybe. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> Dear God. I have to piss on my bonfire. Um, where are we? I've actually lost where we are. We're right at the Kurt Angle Chris Benoit match. We are. I'm just going down this. Li- oh yeah. Um, it was a good match. It could have done with ten more minutes. I think. If if any, yeah, you, know, you could have cut Kane and Bull Buchanan out and give the extra time to this. Let them do a bit more. But it was a nice match. Some good reversals. Um. What else can you say about it, Travis? It was... Uh, it, we obviously would see him do a lot more, like, Rumble 3 and even Wrestle oh, yeah. X7, but... It, uh, for me, maybe I was maybe a little disappointed. I feel like they could have done more. I'm not going to lie. The match had me zone out a little bit. It wasn't as frenetic, frenetic and fast-paced as I thought it might be, in a way. And Rumble 3, for anyone that's listening, for me, is their best match. Like, the best match they had together. <clears throat> yeah, it was great. It was a great match. Oh, yeah, okay. it, go back and look at that. If don't, don't, don't look at this so much. If you want a, a good Chris Benoit Kurt Angle match, look at that. But this wasn't. It wasn't horrendous. But our official result in this match, Matt, is Kurt Angle wins with the Angle Slam. And it kind of came out of nowhere, and it kind of came flat. The finish. Yeah, there was no hype to it. There was no real like heat surrounding it. There were no. Close falls leading into it. It, it. it was just kind of, here's your time. Go out there, do it. And then, 
If it, do you know what? It felt like they got halfway through their routine and the ref just went, oh, go home. And Angle went, oh, I'll just slam you. And Benoit, Benoit went, yeah, fine. What's really sad at this whole segment and what came after, looking back, this was all mapped out as a get the fuck out of there kind of match. And it just, you know, whatever, let's move on. Yeah. To get the British Bulldog in the limelight in England when, A, he wasn't even active in the company full time anymore. And Chris, or the Crash Holly stuff happened immediately after the finish of this match. So it was kind of like on to the next, just kind of, and nothing was ever focused. And I think that might have been, yeah. we talk about the, the slow pace of the match too. Chris Benoit was really injured, really bad. He was bleeding by the end of this. It looked like just disgusting um, on his eye, yeah. quite frankly. Um, so yeah, I can see why probably not his best performance. They only went six minutes too. The, this... <laughs> This open challenge from Crash Holly, though, Matt. Let's move along um, because we can talk about better angle and Benoit matches in the future than this. Um, oh, wow. yeah, we can definitely. Um, what's, this, what's this shenanigans all about with Bulldog and jeans? Dear God. And the entrance music. It was like, did no one care anymore? Just like a dog barking and just some generic, like, drum. Oh, terrible. Uh, by far. And we've covered some really bad British Bulldog matches and periods on this uh on this show travis by far the worst period in his career full stop and that, that that takes in the wcw shit he did in 93 94 it was this was horrendous for the british bulldog he looked he looked terrible and that's putting it nicely i mean it's hard to say <laughs> to poke too much fun here because there's the tragedy that would happen after this, and this was the springboard that led to his evictions and stuff. But he had no business being out there. I know he could have no. came out in an ambassador role and just said hi at this point. Yeah, that would have been better. A host, have him host the show. But, but admittedly, he wasn't telling Vince and people how hurt he was because he was afraid of his losing his spot. You know. Yeah. But then, what sort of mindset must he have been in to be worried about losing a spot that he didn't have? Like he 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 was nothing in in two thousand, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I love the British Bulldog, but in two thousand he'd lost it all. He'd lost his heat. He'd lost his charisma, and he he had some when he wanted to have it. Travis, <clears throat> you know, he'd lost his in ring ability, and he just came out here. He looked heavily dosed up on whatever the fuck he was taking at the time, and to, I, he looked worse than he ever had before, and. He looked fragile. Like, every time Crash touched him, it was like Crash was beating up an old man. You know? It would shake a little bit. It was horrible to watch. Absolutely fucking terrible. And this went way too long. If it had to be booked, you know, if you had to have the Bulldog on the card, if you really couldn't have, you know, got rid of the boner of the reaction you'd get from the Bulldog answering Crash's challenge... Why not make it a squash match and just have him power slam, crash, win in 10 seconds. Everyone goes home happy. Yeah, it's that simple. And it was sad to see him pick him up for the power slam. It really was. It really was. Yeah. This was literally the only place he was over ever anymore because he was getting no reactions. He was a shell of himself in the, in the U.S. Yeah. He, nobody cared anymore. Um, it's really sad. And, tra- and tragically, this, this will be the last time we'd ever see him on, on pay-per-view. This is his last ever pay-per-view match. Yep. Damn. Like, yeah, what what, what a memory to leave. Just this frail, drugged-up, one-time star just staggering through a match. Just just not knowing what he was doing. Yeah. Do you know, I know, you know, it's brought it down a bit, but when he died um, two years later, almost... Well, a, give a week, like two years to the day. I heard, and these might have been wrong, Travis. I've never been able to clarify them. I've he- I heard that he was as good as clean from a lot of the stuff he was taking. And he was actually coming back in 2002 as the Union Jack wearing British Bulldog. I didn't even know that. I didn't. I had no clue that was the in the talks. Yeah, yeah, and it was like <clears throat> he was clean. He was apparent. I'm not going to say he was completely ready because you never know whether to believe rumours or not, Travis. Um, he'd had some matches with his son 
um, on the Indies just before his death. And I believe, <clears throat> and again, I can't you know, say for certain, but all the rumours I heard at the time were he was going to come back and be the one to beat Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. Which would have, how wonderful would that have been to end a career? Yeah, that would have been. Would that have been the right call in the Attitude Era, though? Was he, was he a guy that could have been on the level of an Austin <clears throat> and Rock and had it been believable in a way? Um, I don't. I, do you know what the stuff he was on? I don't think so. I, I think the Bulldog peaked in mid '96, maybe. He had one good match with Owen Hart in 97 and then it was done for him so I, I don't think if he'd have been even if he'd have been pushed at the level of Austin in the Attitude Era I don't think he'd have got there sadly sadly Just too you know? much star power too I feel like even if he was healthy I feel like he anybody no one really had a chance just with Austin Rock alone it's hard to <laughs> yeah. stand out you know exactly I think do you know what Bulldog existed in sort of three eras where there were bigger stars. He existed in the Hogan era. He was never going to get over Hogan in America. He existed in the, the Shawn Michaels era. Where Shawn Michaels wasn't going to let him get over him. And he existed in the Austin era where no one was going to... You know what I mean? No one was going to out, outshine Austin. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> uh, but maybe... Let's pick it up a little bit, because I feel like we killed yeah. the spirits a little bit. Um, we, we have. Where do that take us to next? Hopefully fonder memories. Yes, yeah, so that took us to the Tag Team Championship match. Harley Boys versus Ed, Edge and Christian. And can I just say well done to both teams here? Because the show was sort of... It was dragging by this point, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've had some, some real bad stuff. Um, this this kicked off the end of the card. You know, the end, sec the end section, the last three matches. And this, it started, you know, I'll make that noise of, but it it, <laughs> it it developed into a really good pay-per-view match, like a pay-per-view quality match. It did. It did. It was, it was a great match. And these two teams were red hot at the time, coming off their ladder match at WrestleMania 2000, the rematch at Backlash, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I think they had the rematch. Them or the Dudleys, I can't remember. Either way, those yeah. three teams were, like, attached to the hips for a while during, yes. during this year. Yeah. It would turn out. Uh, Edge and Christian, <clears throat> tremendous, perfect guys to make heels out of all the tag team as the top heels. They were just, they were great at it. Yeah. The the look, the attitude, the smugness, like how could, they're born heels, both of them. Exactly. And, and the Hardys born baby faces at this time too. Yes. I, nobody was going to cheer yeah. against the Hardys. Ultra popular with females. I didn't, was Lita with them yet? I think right before this maybe. <sighs> I'm tempted to say yes, but then I'm tempted to say no because was she not with S.A. Rios at Backlash? I think you're right. I think you're right. Like, I, f I feel like on their entrance on this, I remember seeing glimpses of Lita on their Titan Tron, but I could be wrong. I'm just so used to seeing that over the years. I mean, maybe. I, I know. Did they save her from S.A. Rios when he had, like, the whole bad attitude wife beater thing going on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So maybe that was the night after Backlash, there which was like five days before Well, you'd this. think they would at least have her out there with them then, you know? <laughs> yeah, she wasn't even on the card. Never mind. <laughs> the match, it, it was, you know, a typical match these teams would have was fast-paced, good spots. Um, A lot of the guys at the time talk about Edge was like the, the mad scientist. I feel like Edge maybe was the one putting this match together along with Matt Hardy, the two guy. you know what I mean? But the, yes. the finish, Matt, it was, it was all right, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was... It was fine. Um, I found JR's line better than the finish when Edge clocked Jeff Hardy with the ring bell for the disqualification and JR shouted, they're calling for the bell, but it's in the ring. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pretty good, that JR. You're in it. God. <laughs> He's hitting the sauce a little too early that night. Um. Yes. And, of course, the, to set up um, what's to come at SummerSlam, etc., Dudley's appear, put Edge through possibly the smallest hardest table I've ever seen in a wrestling yeah, when you guys have like small dinners over there what's up with your tables in England I know you wouldn't have fit like two people around that would you no. plus all the plates and everything 
you couldn't get Rikishi on that table alone with two people. I mean, yeah, it you was couldn't very get Rikishi's tiny. ass cheek on but, that But, you table. know, for as, t- <laughs> for as tiny as that table was, it looked really painful when Edge got the powerbomb through it. And you know what? Yeah. For as much as that had to suck taking that move, the camera didn't even focus on Edge selling it. As soon as Bubba Ray Dudley powerbombed <laughs> him through it, immediately on his little face and his goatee. They just stayed on it. And you never saw Edge again. <sighs> yeah. Poor Edge. <laughs> Poor Edge. He must have been lying there thinking, well, oh, what the fuck have I just done that for? Wasted. I Wasted. Mean, you come and... to think full circle where his career went with neck injuries and retiring, that kind of sucks. That's one of yeah. the spots that probably contributed to it, and you couldn't even show it on camera. That's it. <laughs> How gutted must he have been when he watched that back? He probably skips it. He probably just stews over that one spot. He's like, man, what if that was the spot? If I do it all, no. Because I, I know he had, like, a surgery before this or something. Um, yes. But that yeah. was fine. The Dudleys, like we said, massively over, and they were going to bigger and better things. The, the TLC matches after this, and they're just one of the greatest tag team feuds in history, which involved three teams, not just two. So, there you go. Yes. Was and this match well of the done, night, or would you say the next match, Matt, in your opinion, was match of the night? Do you know what? I'm going to say the tag team match was the match of the night, because I found the next match to be too short. Like, like the Benoit angle match, this needed another five, ten minutes. Exactly. And I agreed completely. The tag match was my match of the night. Yes. Um, this led us to, though, Matt, what? <clears throat> the European Championship match. Uh, Eddie Guerrero versus Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho, also Intercontinental Champion, going into this. And <laughs> they had to flip a coin, Travis. That, that well-known wrestling method of deciding which title was going to be defended... The flip of the coin to decide who was going to defend their title. And wouldn't you know it, Eddie Guerrero lost. Wouldn't you know and... who won the pony? <laughs> I feel like Jack Tony should have been out there flipping the coin. Didn't feel right. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like uh, it felt like 88. Like, flip the coin. You're going to defend your title. Let's get on with it. Yeah. And also, I think Eddie Guerrero had already killed the crowd. Um... I don't want to bash Eddie Guerrero, great talent, but the fucking promo he cut, dear God. It's like, obviously, how this, long wasn't, can... this wasn't the Eddie at the heights we would see Eddie in later years. He was kind of getting his feet wet in WWE, and fans yeah. didn't take to him at first. No. And judging by this, I'm not surprised. Like, how long can one man talk for without actually saying anything? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might have been... Like by design too to have a, a, a heel keep cutting a long promo until you can't take it anymore. Until finally the baby face interrupts and gets a great pop. But it's way too long and it wasn't executed well at all. Like Angle at this time would have been the guy to give that to, not Eddie Guerrero. Yes, because Eddie Guerrero <laughs> yeah. was like we said, getting his feet wet, getting used to that style. All the radicals admittedly came out saying at this time it took them a while to make that transition. They hated it at first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I agree. Um, there's some wrestlers you should just keep a microphone out the hand of. For a while, uh, Eddie Guerrero was one of them in 2000. Until you know what direction you want to go and 2000. find the right gimmick for the guy, and then yeah, that's when you start. Yes, going. yes. Um, like Nia Jax in the present, he should have kept a microphone out there and long before, before now. But <clears throat> you know what? They they love people to talk because they think it gets them over, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has the reverse effect. We mentioned, uh, we forgot to mention, I should say, another thing on the show. There was a there was a promo earlier, or a shot, I should say, of Triple H and Stephanie. It just reminded me real quick. And I remember, yes. I remember you tweeting me earlier this week how weird it is to go back and see Stephanie, how <laughs> different she sounds. It's crazy. Completely different person. Yeah. The pre-boob job, Stephanie. You know, this is... Uh, you wouldn't sure, know it's Stephanie, her. you could say. No. Um, no. I, I've, heard, I've heard of... I've heard of a few stories. Yeah. Like, she should never have got married in white. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, Scarlet letters handed out by men. <laughs> she was hot, though. I mean, come on, Travis. Oh, undeniable. You know? Undeniable. Stephanie was one of... Uh, probably shouldn't be saying this, but when I was in my teens, like, Terry, Stephanie, Trish, like, I have posters of all of them that I possibly ruined but let's not go into that oh, right now let's move it on so let, let, let's move on we that. just got a strike on the app no i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> <laughs> i just want to throw that in how weird it is guys if you haven't done it go back at this time and check out stephanie man she sounds yes. like she's in high school maybe even younger um 
But this match, Chris Jericho and Eddie Guerrero, I mean, what can you say? It was pretty much a paint-by-numbers match with those. Not given a lot of time. The result, Matt, yeah. though, Eddie Guerrero taking some gold? Well, he's out. Yeah. That was it, wasn't it, really? Um, do you know what I'm annoyed at, Travis? It's like all the title matches WWE bought over here, not one change um, apart from 92 with the Intercontinental title. Not one change that I can remember in England until William Regal and Tajiri won the tag team titles in 2003, I'm going to say. Yeah. Oof. Um, oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. 05? European title. European title changed hands at one night only in 97. That's true. Yeah. But it, it, I think in a way, too, that also made these shows feel... Let's be honest, unspecial. Because you knew yeah. nothing of significance was ever going to happen. Exactly. Even, even very, progressing very main angles didn't happen on these shows. They were treated like house shows just happened to be on camera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or in this case, um, just a, another backlash, but without any story to it. It was like, j just give them a, a, a watered-down version of backlash. No story, no title changes, nothing really special. But British they're backlash. staff, so they'll eat it up. A British backlash. Like that. They should have just fucking had the backlash set there. Just brought it for another night. It's better than just the Raw stage, I guess. Um, <laughs> every that. show, though, Matt, from the granddaddy of all WrestleMania to the loneliest little outlaw indie show, always has a main event. It is main yes. event time. Insurrection 2000. Triple threat match. WWF titled The Rock. Brand new champion defending against Shane McMahon and Triple H. <laughs> My God, there must have been someone better, Travis. Like, a 2000 Shane McMahon. Uh, and I know they did this to stack the deck against The Rock and have him have the hero come back, blah de blah But, come on, you know? You had... You could have done this with Kurt Angle. Yeah, I yeah, think it's a lot could, of guys they could have just thrown in. And, and you, you, could have even, a, you could have even spun it like that he was being paid by the McMahons to take out The Rock, even if it was a Exactly. Field, you know? Give us the SummerSlam 2000 main event here. Undertaker, Be kind. Undertaker was on his way back, and we saw glimpses of the Judgment yes. Day vignettes throughout this whole show. He would be back at Judgment Day in a month, so he wasn't there yet. But I still feel like I totally agree. Was, even a Dean Malenko, you could have, they hired Malenko <laughs> to take out The Rock. Would have worked. Anyone would have been an improvement. Anyone, but they Apart didn't. Big show. They didn't. This is what we got, and you know, quite frankly, The Rock and Triple H in 2000, dare I say, both their peaks in ring, and they were just they they would had great matches every time they touched. And the match was pretty much them doing the load, as you would expect, taking the load. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was the uh, it was the standard Rock Triple H match, and that's not knocking it, Travis. It's like yeah. they had good matches. Um, their Iron Man match for me was better than Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels because it was more action pack to have more to it i'm so glad to hear you say that because i feel like the uh, brett sean match is one of the most overrated matches ever because it's just not a lot happening for most of it do you know what, nostalgia wise it's it's up there with the greatest you know because it was when we were kids it was off they're going to wrestle for an hour like our two, one, two of our favorite wrestlers ever brilliant but it, you know it shit the bed in the ring Hot takes from both of us guys come at us. It's not as good as people claim. There's a couple bright spots, but I feel like that match by design was just picked and choose to have like th those those clips they can show in further vignettes with the ring announcer getting super kicked yeah. and just Sean diving to the outside. That's really it. Um, it was and just... the end. The end made no sense at all. Like what? So Sean couldn't beat Brett in 60 minutes, but he can do it in the extra five. Thanks. Yeah. Pretty much. But this match, typical Rock Triple H match brawl, and all that outside, every main event in the Attitude Era had to brawl into the crowd somewhat on the outside for the most of it. Um, that happened. Yeah. The, the Vince made his way down towards the end of the match. This, I mean, the finish, I feel like, was executed fine. It, it went off without a hitch. It, it, the fans left happy, like you said earlier. Yeah. And the had Rock, all the distractions. Had all the distractions you'd expect. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, because there was not a title change, The Rock gets the win, Matt. <laughs> yes. Um... Do you know what? I, th I think that's fine. You know, Triple H was going to win at Judgment Day anyway. So there was no Bulldog in the main event. So Vince thought, oh, my God, Rock's a god in 2000 in England. So he has to win. And that's fine because The Rock got a massive reception, Travis. This was like, 
honestly, I'm going to put this on par with you couple all the Bulldogs' previous UK receptions into one and then add a little more on top, and that's how The Rock was treated. Oh, yeah, and that speaks volumes if you're getting a bigger reaction than Bulldog in the early 90s in England. And that's yeah. just, what can you say? That's where The Rock was at this time. He was on fire. Yeah, and what, honestly, like, what a star. Like, even the, his, his pre-match promo didn't really say anything, but it was brilliant no. because of his, the delivery. During this time, when you know, when he when he went babyface again, you know, and he didn't have to say anything. That was the beauty of his promos. He would just go out there and just spit random crap, and it worked. Yeah, and make yeah. fun of guys and impersonate guys, and that was it. That's all he ever had to do. Um, and he did it bloody well. And look, what, and whatever happened to him, Travis? I don't know. You don't hear a lot about him anymore. He's only the biggest no, star no. in the world. Um, Forty million a movie. Jesus, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I want to be The Rock? It's, it's not a bad gig, I hear. If, if anyone in Hollywood's listening, like, I can read lines. I'm yeah. more than willing to accept a, a few million on the paycheck. There you go. I'm willing and to can, bet this may be one of the better shows we've reviewed in recent memory, Matt. Um, what do you grade? It was. Union, or not Union Smack, Jesus Christ. Insurrection 2000. <laughs> before, before we grade, can I just say, um, I promised him, thanks to Rob at Monkey News 1987, who sent me a tweet earlier this week about Insurrection, who said, like, after the cameras went off, Earl Hebner delivered the best people's elbow he'd ever seen, even oh. better than The Rocks. So thank you, Rob, for your input. And thank oh. you for listening. Look at that DVD. And thank you, Rob. Yes, most definitely appreciate it. That DVD, though, WWE put out with, like, after the camera stopped rolling. I wonder if that was on there. Was that not Raw after the show? The three-disc box set? Uh, I, had, yeah. I watched that. Fucking terrible. Awful. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> 45 minute Austin segment on that. That was, and that was too much. Well, you know? you've graded that DVD in it. <clears throat> but what do you grade once again? Insurrection, the correct show this time, 2000. I'm going to give it a C. Um, bang in the middle. You know, it wasn't brilliant, wasn't terrible. Best one we've had in three weeks. Last three matches, pretty good. Yeah, the top half of this card, obviously, way better than the bottom half. Um, yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense, though, because usually out of the gate, you want to get the crowd hyped. They did that, though, with Too Cool. It just wasn't... Yeah. The memorable I mean, I, I stuff said... happened, like, after the match, I feel like, you know. Yeah. And I said to you earlier, uh, I said to you earlier this week on Twitter, like, it was paced wrong, the, the card. You, you probably could have had Jericho and Guerrero go on first and give them more time. And then Hardy's in the middle... And then the main event, you know, just a dot the dot the good. Spread that shit the, out, basically, is what. Matt's yeah. Saying. Don't just clump it all in. I agree completely. Um, I'm gonna grade it. I'm gonna grade it C plus, just for how good the tag <laughs> match was, and how, just quite frankly, the reactions guys were getting. Always, when you see that, it it just brings up morale watching a show. I feel like when you see these insane pops, we got multiple ones. Yes. Yeah. And. I think we can both agree it's the best thing we've reviewed in three weeks, Travis. Like hands down, without a hands doubt. Down. God, I borderline. But, I was going to say that the Royal Albert Hall show made this look like every match Steamboat and Savage, but not that good. <laughs> One more but, time, Matt Tennant. Where can everyone check you out? You can check me out on Twitter at the Perfect Tenant. Um, you can buy my book, which is coming soon. And Travis, we forgot just to tell everyone next week, Insurrection 2003, as voted for by all of you lovely people. So Matt, put it out again. You guys voted. You have picked Insurrection 03. I know nothing about that show. Matt's <laughs> filled me in a little bit. We're headed there next week. Thank you guys, as always, for all the support, for voting, yes, for watching the show. It means the world to both of us. Thanks a lot. That being said, Matt, we've done it. As always, follow me on Twitter. Yes. At Mickey TMD. Hit that subscribe right down below. Check out the reset button there. Slam Pigs Podcast. Never drew a dime. Vicky High Spots. Hit Vicky Pro. So much goodness coming. Look at that. Until well, then. You've got, you've got that wig and lipstick on, and you're whoring like like Moolah in the in the 70s, aren't you? I may or not, may not be standing on a corner right now. Why am I <laughs> you are. He is, everyone. He is. He I am the variable hooker for Vicky TMD. This is the <laughs> maniac, Matt Tennant. Until next week, Slam Pigs. You just smack. Cheerio, mates.